Good morning, everybody. God bless you and welcome. Isn't it great to be together in the Lord's presence? Thank you so much, worship team, for helping to lead us into the Lord's presence today. And uh, we want to welcome everybody to Harvest Time. If uh, we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Pastor Nick. I'm the associate pastor here. And uh, we're just so delighted. What a, what a beautiful time we've been having in the Lord's presence since Thursday night, amen, with Dr. Clark and his team. Is there anybody uh, here this morning that you're here for the first time in these meetings? Anybody who's here for the first time? All right. We've got some folks with us. Let's welcome these friends that are here with us for the first time this morning. We've been having an awesome time uh, as Dr. Clark uh, and the team have been teaching and praying for us. How many of you have had uh, some touch where you know that God has definitely done something in your body? All right, all right, look around. That's a faith builder right there. And I think uh, Randy would probably also say that uh, just as important uh, is the fact that uh, we gain uh, understanding, we learn, we progress in our understanding of healing, how healing works, how to more effectively uh, minister healing to people. How many of you can say that you've advanced in your understanding of healing and how to better pray and pray with more boldness for people? Amen. That's so awesome. Uh, a few things for your comfort uh, before we move on this morning. want to let you know that restrooms are available to you in the lobby, so just go out the back doors of the sanctuary, and there's restrooms there. Also in the lobby, uh, our friends Napo and Jessica are there uh, with their coffee cart, and uh, they are fabulous baristas, and we've been enjoying uh, all of their creations. Amen. So uh, avail yourself of that. Uh, again, and there's also um, some bottled water out there and just some granola bars for you. Um, we also have, uh, at the conclusion of, uh, of this session, as we head into uh, a lunchtime, uh, we've got some fantastic food trucks available for you. They're down here going down towards the lower level parking lot, and uh, that'll be uh, a blessing uh, as well, because that was, that was good stuff, amen. Um, if you're in the area, maybe you're here visiting, maybe you're here for the conference, or maybe you just don't have a local church to attend, we'd love to have you with us tomorrow morning. We have uh, three services uh, at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30 a.m., and uh, Dr. Clark is going to be ministering in all three of those services, for, so we're very excited about that. We also have uh, nursery care for infants and toddlers in all of our services. One other thing, uh, if you're excited to go to church tomorrow morning, and I know you all are, don't forget to change your clock, uh, because it, you're, you're picking up an hour of sleep, praise the Lord, uh, tonight, so spring ahead, fall back tonight, and uh, if you need anything uh, during your time with us, uh, we'd be so happy to help you, and just, uh, oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, if, if you've already uh, had your fill of food truck and you want to go exploring off campus, uh, we do have uh, a list for you in the lobby of restaurants. Uh, that are available to you in the local area. So uh, if you just want to go uh, scouting about, take advantage of that and um, praise the Lord. All right, it, it is such a blessing to have with us uh, to share this morning our friend William Wood. William is Dr. Randy's associate and uh, he's got a powerful testimony and I know that the Lord has given him a powerful message to, to bless us and challenge us this morning. So let's uh, welcome our friend William as he comes this morning. I'll put it on mute. How are we doing this morning? Good? Awesome. Well, I see who the morning people are, right? <laughs> I'd like for you to know I'm going to need your help this morning because I am not a morning person. But Dr. Clark is constantly challenging me to become a morning person <laughs> by doing all of his morning sessions, so... I'm glad to have a mentor like him to constantly stretch me. Um, I know I am from the state of Alabama, and anytime you see a man come to church on Saturday morning in the state of Alabama, you know revival has broken out. <laughs> because college football is king there, and Alabama is always number one or two in the nation. So <laughs> but, you know. 
That's a side note. Do not crucify me yet this morning. I haven't started yet. But I do have a couple of things I wanted to talk with you about before we get into today's session. I have a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I don't want to waste a lot of time cracking jokes and making fun of people. Anyways, sorry. I have written my first booklet. It's called Walking in the Wilderness. Um, I asked Dr. <laughs> Dr. Clark has been been talking with me over the past six months or so to get some of my material out in book form just just so that people can have it to take home with them to study and to con continue to grow in what the revelation the Lord has given me as well. And I asked Dr. Clark yesterday, I was like, well, how many books have you written? He said, oh, around 43. I'm like, oh, man, I have 42 more to go. <laughs> and I just really got depressed all of a sudden, you know. I was like, Lord, please deliver me of depression right now. And so I just had to not think about how many books that he has written. But this book in particular, Walking in the Wilderness, actually came from a dream that I had around eight years ago. And in this dream, I saw uh, this, this wood line, kind of like this tree line here. And over the top of the tree line, I saw the word wilderness. And then I saw men and women coming out of the tree line with the words written over their heads, mature son and mature daughter. Now, what's interesting to me about that dream is that I came out of the dream, and I'm like, man, everything I've ever heard about the wilderness season has always been negative. It's always been a place of barrenness. Has that been your understanding of the wilderness? And so that dream really puzzled me in the sense of, it looked like the people that were coming out of the wilderness was actually matured in God and matured as a, as a daughter and a son. So I was like, well, maybe my perspective needs to shift. Oftentimes, we do not receive the promises we want because the perspective that we have is actually working in opposition to the promise. And for, for some of us in this room... The perspective you have is actually keeping you from the promise you need. And so what I started doing is I looked at scripture and I looked at Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus went to his wilderness. Because he's the best example to follow, would you say? And I noticed the very first thing that it says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. It says the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And then I, was, I started thinking, I said, well, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, and maybe I need to think more about this. Because here's the thing, the Spirit would never lead you into a place of barrenness, only refreshing. And maybe the season that we have perceived to be a place of, of barrenness could potentially be the place that we can experience our greatest river source of pleasure and refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Because if you notice in the wilderness, Jesus went into the wilderness led by the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness empowered by the Spirit. There are no recorded miracles in the Gospels until Jesus comes out of the wilderness. Look at it. So maybe the season is more significant than what we realize. Maybe the season has been been determined to mature us as sons and daughters so that we can come out of the wilderness clothed with power. Because if you also notice in the wilderness that, that Jesus went and confronted Satan in private before he triumphed over him in public. I said, I said Jesus defeated Satan in private before he triumphed over him in public. You see, you will never have a public display of authority over something that's defeating you in private. Okay, I'll move on from that. Good. So, I would like to give this book to someone. Does anybody have a birthday today? I just saw faith on you, lady. You just stood up to your feet. I just saw faith all over you. You come and get this. Come on. Bless you. And I'm actually doing a follow-up booklet to this, to this one right here, and it's, I've titled it Imitating Jesus. And that message is based on the men and women that I saw coming out of the wilderness in the dream. And I go over eight specific characteristics that mark the life of Christ that I believe this emerging generation of mature sons and daughters, those eight specific characteristics are going to mark their life as well. So that's a, I'm hoping to have that out by April. 
Um, here's another booklet called Open Heaven. And this is one of my favorite booklets that Dr. Clark has, has, has done because it deals with the issue of healing in relation to an, the angelic presence, cooperating with the angelic host of heaven. And see, and it's actually saying this right now actually reminds me of a, a testimony. I was in a men's group. We used to do a men's group where I pastored in Alabama. And in this men's group, we had many people from many different denominations. And me and this one particular guy were having an intense fellowship about healing. In other words, we were arguing. <laughs> his, his thing, God didn't heal. My thing was, well, it's all in Scripture. <laughs> you know, God still heals today. And so we were in this argument about healing. And all of a sudden, an angel... And I'm seeing this with my, my, own, my own eyes. An angel walks in through the wall. And when he walks in through the wall, he, he announces, I'm a healing angel. <laughs> but, but my friend didn't see it. But when I see this angel, I'm like, all this faith just rolls up inside of me. I'm like, man. I said, well, how about this? Let's test it out. You say you don't believe in healing. And, and his whole basis was that he had gout in his feet. He was lived in constant pain, constant swelling all the time. And I saw this angel standing on, against the wall. I said, well, what about this? Can you come right over here and stand? <laughs> stand right here, you know. You know, to him, looking back now, God makes us look better than what we really are, you know. Because it looked like I really knew what I was doing. But the thing was, I just saw an angel standing there, right? And so... I said, just come over here and stand right here. He said, okay, okay, I'm going to prove a point to you. I said, because I feel like if you stand over here, you're going to be healed. You know, he's like, yeah, no, I'm not. And so he walks over. As soon as he get, gets where the, the angel is, the presence of the angel, this angel touches him on the top of his head, and the power of God goes through his body and immediately heals him on the spot. He... He gets, he gets so excited, he, we, we, he actually goes outside, and I follow him outside. He's so excited, he starts kicking a tree, trying to make his feet hurt. He's like, this cannot happen! Ah! And he starts kicking this tree, you know, like, my, my, I'm always in pain. I said, well, no, you used to be always be in pain. And then I told him to stretch his mind a little more. I said, well... I, I know you probably think that I'm full of wisdom and revelation right now because I told you to stand in this one specific place, right? I said, but I actually saw an angel step in through the wall, and he announced himself as a healing angel. And that's the reason you're healed, because you stood in the presence of that angel. And it completely shifted his entire mind. And now that, that guy now goes around teaching on healing, <laughs> praying for the sick. Isn't that amazing? Come on. So, is there anyone here that will love to learn how to cooperate with the angelic? You. There you go. Thank you so much. God bless. Yes, bless you. I do have one more book that I would like to give away. Is that okay? Yeah. I was 1037, so I need to hurry up, I guess. This book here. It's called Power to Heal. Now, I know Dr. Randy Clark has already mentioned this book, but I love to talk about it everywhere I go because it's impacting my life in a very, very powerful way. How many of us know that Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power to become a witness? Now, what Christians tend to do is we tend to reduce that scripture down to just preaching. But no, becoming a witness is becoming a witness not to the message of Christ, but also the demonstration of Christ's life. Because the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had is the same Holy Spirit that we have empowering us to live the life that he lived. In other words, Jesus didn't just live for you. He lived as you. He role modeled, he role modeled the life and lifestyle of every believer. And so one of the teachings in this book, Power to Heal, is the teachings of words of knowledge. Now, Dr. Randy Clark has been talking a lot about words of knowledge over the past couple of days. This book, that teaching there has is, is, is helped me to develop a, a language for what the Lord has been teaching me for many years. And matter of fact, I was just at a few, one of my grandfather's funeral a couple of months ago. He just passed away and went on to be with the Lord. He was 86 years old. He loved the Lord. But when I went, me and my wife went to his funeral, 
some of the, my family members, most of them are, are Baptist, and nothing against Baptists. You really learn how to go after the, the lost. They re- do really well with that. And I think there's some things we need to learn about that, right? But one of my family members, he was a pastor, and he actually invited me to come and teach in his church. And so guess what I taught on? <laughs> I taught on words of knowledge, and I prayed for the sick. <laughs> But in his service, I saw 50% of the people, 50% of his congregation was healed just by simply teaching on words of knowledge and giving the words of knowledge. And that was before we laid hands on people. But my pastor, uh, my my family friend, he didn't realize that we called him words of knowledge. And so I met him at my grandfather's funeral. He walked up to me. He says, you remember those miracle words you guys were doing last time you were here? I was like, oh, you mean words of knowledge? Well, you can call it anything that you want. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I'm just, I'm blown away that the fact I'm still healed. <laughs> it's like, because one of the words of knowledge was for him. You know, he was expecting, okay, a little bit of pain to leave, a couple of days to come back. Like, he was amazed that he was still healed. And keep this in context, we're at my grandfather's funeral. Well, he grabs my hand. He says, listen, will you come and pray for my wife? And he starts taking me at my grandfather's funeral now. All of a sudden, healing's beginning to break out at my grandfather's funeral. And and he takes me over. We start praying for people. And all of a sudden, me and my wife have a line. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, well, I know my granddad is just excited right now looking down from heaven. And we start praying for people at my grandfather's funeral. Well, this one particular guy starts manifesting the Holy Ghost in the funeral. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, man, this is going to go really good or really bad right now. I said, man, we need to take this guy outside, you know. And so I take him outside, and wisdom was not on me in that moment because we just stopped at the entrance door. <laughs> bad idea. And so I just laid my hands on him I said, and asked for the Holy Spirit to fill him. And when I did that, bam, he just falls in the floor in front of the entrance door. And there's still people coming in to, to put my grandfather's funeral and people getting out like, oh, my God. What kind of funeral is this? Because he's out there flopping like a fish, you know. And I'm like, I'm like oh, don't, don't pay him any attention. The Holy Spirit is on him. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? And I can just see my grandfather and from heaven excited about his grandson Amen. following Jesus. Is there, is there a pastor here this morning that you have not read this book or you would like to have this book here? You? You're a pastor? You are? Just come up here and get it. I'll just put it right here for you, okay? Anyway. Okay. I would like to talk to you this morning on the subject of faith. And Dr. Clark has done a really, really good job over the past couple of days speaking on the subject. I'm going to try to attempt to speak on it in two different fashions. The first way, I'm going to speak on the faith in Christ. But on the second, I'm going to speak on the faith of Christ. Because I feel like this day and time that God is shifting us as a church Well, we don't just simply have faith in Jesus, but we begin to actually demonstrate the faith of Jesus. And so this first teaching that I'm going to do is in relation to the faith in Christ and in the sense of partnering with his promises, partnering with his words and the things that he has declared. And I'm going to share with you some principles that the Lord has taught me over the years of how I partner with the promises of God and how I see those promises come about in my life. Now, Dr. Clark is a storyteller. Now, I'm more of a, a point person. Where's my point people, right? <laughs> come on. Me and Dr. Clark are like on two opposite ends of the spectrum, you know. But he has taught me how to bring in stories in my messages so I'm going to try to hit both sides, give a point, and share a story, right? But with that, the way that I teach is I actually believe the Bible. (laughs) And a lot of people are like, are you word of faith? Well, I said, would you rather me be word of doubt? (laughs) You know? 
No, I just actually believe what the Word of God says. And so this morning, I want to start with a passage of Scripture that should challenge every single one of us in this room, because I know it certainly challenges me. And it's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and we're going to look at verse 5. And this is a promise, a prophetic promise of what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. And it says this right here in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And listen to what it says here. And by his wounds or by his stripes, we what? Are healed. I don't know about you, but oftentimes my experience contradicts the word. And whenever your experience contradicts the word of God, you have to make make this choice or this decision in your life. What am I going to to allow to dictate truth to me? Is it going to be my experience or his word? Are you going to allow your experiences to define his truth or are you going to allow his truth to define your experiences? Because the word of God says for by his wounds we are healed. See, what we tend to do as Christians is we tend to spiritualize what God intended for us to actualize. And we only see this in a spiritual sense. Christ has healed us spiritually. No, he has paid the debt for you to walk in wholeness physically. He has paid the debt for us to walk in wholeness every single day of our life. You see, for me, I refuse to develop a belief system that allows for sickness. After I gave my life to the Lord, and I'll share that with you later on, I had a dramatic encounter with God where he supernaturally healed me and set me free of drugs and alcohol. But when I had that encounter with God, I knew that he was a healing God. I knew that he wanted me to walk in wholeness. He wanted me to walk in freedom. And when I came to this passage of Scripture in Isaiah 53, 5, it just, I mean, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But as soon as I started teaching on that verse, sickness came on me. Sickness. And I remember, it was, it, was a, it was the last time I was sick, actually. I remember when the sickness came on me, because I, I was going somewhere to preach. I couldn't even go there to preach because I was, it was coming out all kinds of different places. I don't even want you to imagine or picture that. And I think, I think you just did, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I repent. <laughs> but I got violently sick. But I had just studied this script, and I was like, no, this can't be right. I, no, I'm not putting up with sickness. I'm not going to allow the sickness to influence my thought pattern. Some of us are still sick because, because sickness has influenced the way you think. Okay. Let me try this side. Some of us are still sick in this room because we have allowed sickness to influence our perspective on healing. We have allowed sickness to, to determine The sickness is still available. Guess what? It's not. It's illegal. Okay. And so I started quoting the scripture over me. And I started saying, no, by his wounds I am healed. I mean, I would look in the mirror, by his wounds I'm healed. You know what I'm saying? Anybody do that besides me? Sometimes you just got to preach to yourself. I mean, look, come on now. And so I just started declaring this Bible verse over me, over and over. I would, I would quote it, and I would throw up in the commode <laughs> and do some other things. Anyway, and I, I would quote it over myself and get sick all over again. And this went on for two hours, two to three hours. And the last time I was out, I was, I was exhausted. But the last time I quoted the Bible verse over myself, and I went to my bed to lay down, and I said, for by his wounds I am healed, and I just fell back onto the bed. As soon as my back and my head hit the bed, a person, it felt like a person lifted off of me, and the sickness immediately left. That was, that was 12 years ago, and I haven't been sick since. So my thing is, if, if I'm not sick and maybe you are, then maybe I have something to say about this. <laughs> is that I, a sickness completely left me in that moment, and that's when I realized that truth is greater than reality. Why? Reality changes, truth does not change. And what happens many times is that we'll have an experience that's an inferior reality to God's truth. 
And then we allow that inferior reality to, to define God's word, define, define God's truth. You see, we are not called to develop a belief system of facts. We've called to develop a belief system of truth. Just because something is true doesn't mean that it's truth. And too many times we, we develop belief systems around our sickness instead of around God's word or around our circumstances instead of around God's word. You see, I have just chosen to live my life in a way that truth is going to reign in my mind. The truth is going to become the perspective in which I see life through. You see, I constantly challenge myself with truth. I constantly challenge myself to find and identify what is God's greatest truth for me in every situation. Because I know that truth is going to constantly pull me out of the place that I'm in and into the place truth provides. <laughs> About three months after... This sickness left me. My testimony of how I got saved just went all throughout my family. And I started having people call me. It was like, William, we, we, we know the type of life that you lived. And I want to know the Jesus that you've met. Because the Jesus that you're talking about is different than the one I'm hearing about on Sunday morning. This guy doesn't have any power. But, <laughs> but the Jesus you talk about and what I see demonstrated in your life, there's power to it. And I want to know about this Jesus. Well, my grandmother calls me. And she says, she tells me this, William, I really want to know about this Jesus that I hear about with you so much because you're different. I know you. You lie, cheat, and steal. You don't do that anymore. You actually love people now. So <laughs> something's got to be to this, you know. And so I said, Grandmother, this is what I want to do for you. I want to come and do a Bible study with you every Sunday afternoon. She said, yes, we can do that. Well, at the time, I didn't know that she was diagnosed with cancer. And so, and she didn't tell me. And guess what I was teaching on the whole time that I went there? Wow. Isaiah 53, verse 5. By his wounds we are healed. And over the weeks and over the months that I was there with my grandmother, I, I began to notice that she was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Over the course of six months, she told me that she wanted to give her life to the Jesus that she saw in my life. And I had this wonderful opportunity to lead my grandmother to the Lord before she passed away. But after about six months of going and just sharing with her and just teaching her this word right here, this truth right here, my sister calls me one morning as, as I'm preparing my things to go and minister with her that afternoon. My sister calls me and says, wait, I just, I just found a grandmother. She's passed away. She's passed away in her bed. And all of a sudden, it felt like there was this Goliath standing in front of me, taunting me with the truth of God. And I just went to God. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. I know your word is truth. I know what, you, what you've accomplished for us is, is for us to walk in. But I don't understand why my grandmother just died. And I just really had this engaging conversation with God. Listen, it's okay. It's okay to come to him the way that you are. It's okay to come to him with your questions. But at some point, you need, you've got to stop asking God why and start asking God to teach you his ways. Yes. You see, and in that engagement with God where I was communing and talking with him, I changed the way that I was asking because I was kept saying, why did my grandmother die? But then I realized this is the wrong question. And I said, God, teach me how to see your word being produced in my life. And in that moment, I felt, I felt the faith of God come inside of me. In that, in that moment, I just felt this security inside of me. Two weeks later, two weeks later, after I make this choice and I'm going to allow truth to become the driving force of my thinking, I worked at a chemical company at the time, and my, my manager, he was very used to me because I prayed for every person that came into the, the chemical company, all the UPS drivers, all the FedEx drivers, you know. I'm bam, we're praying for them right now. You're getting saved, healed, and delivered before you leave, you know. <laughs> Come on. And so this UPS driver comes in. His nickname is Fish. <laughs> Come on, you're in Alabama. Come on now. <laughs> fried chicken and fried fish. I do not need to get off on food. That is my love language. If I get on that rabbit trail, I will be there for another hour. 
But this UPS driver comes in. I, I can tell that he has this downcast uh, look on his face. And so I walk over and says, excuse me, Fish, uh, well, you look a little sad today. Is there something I can pray with you with? He says, well, my wife is in the hospital with stage four cancer dying. And once again, there's that Goliath. Once again, there's the devil taunting me. Once again, there's the enemy coming up against God's word, up against my promise, up against his truth, saying, you, this, you may think this is true, but it's not. You see, this interest, interesting story about young, young David and Goliath is that when David was going up against Goliath, he didn't really see Goliath as an issue, did he? Because he understood who the person was that he was serving. He understood that he really had, he had the God of all of Israel behind him. And he was the only one that could realize the king that he really served. And see, when he was going up against Goliath, he didn't see him as a stumbling block. He saw him as a stepping stone. And when he picked up these stones to go against Goliath, the very thing that came against him to destroy him became the very place that God catapulted him into divine purpose. It's okay. You don't have to get excited. The size of the Goliath coming against you reveals the level of the promise God wants to give you. You need to stop looking at the enemy as a stumbling block and start looking at him as a stepping stone. He's been disarmed and defeated. He's underneath your feet. I even look at the way the enemy attacks me differently now because I understand when, the, he, when he attacks me, it's time for promotion. When he attacks me, it's, God is trying to do something greater in my life and the enemy wants to stop it. And so now when I look at the temptations of the enemy, I understand, no, nope, it's time for promotion and I'm actually going to use this thing, this place of temptation as a catapult into divine purpose and destiny. And so here I am standing in front, of, in front of this man telling me that his wife's dying with cancer. And this just rolls up inside of me. I says, God's going to heal her. Let me pray for you. I lay hands on, on the UPS driver. I pray for him. Nothing happens in the moment. He goes home. When he gets home, there's a, 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 a voicemail on his answer machine from the doctor saying, listen, you need to come in immediately. He gets to the hospital the doctor sit him down, began to talk with him and said, listen, we've been doing tests all morning and, and we have to tell you this, this is very strange, but we cannot find an ounce of cancer in your wife's body. Come on. It was all because I chose to embrace truth and not a lie. It was all because I allowed truth to define my experience and not my experience to define my truth. And it's time for us as believers, it's time for us as Christians to learn to partner with his promises, to partner with his word. Because his word is truth. His word is greater than all reality than what you have experienced. I refuse to live a life inferior to the one that Jesus bought and paid for on the cross. He died so that I can live. He took the healing, of, he took the wounds upon himself so that I can walk in healing, so that I can walk in freedom, so that I can walk in joy, so that I, y'all come on. So what I want to do now is from this experience, I identified how the enemy attacks our promise, how it, the enemy attacks the truth. And the Lord also taught me how to partner with the truth and how to partner with his promises. From this experience that I had 12 years ago, the Lord has been constantly teaching me ever since that moment. And the first way the enemy attacks your promise or your truth is that he attacks it internally. In other words, if he can keep, destroy the promise in you, he can keep the promise from you. 
Most of God's promises never make it past to pass the place of, of the realm of our imagination. It never makes it past the place of internal revelation, internal truth. Listen, truth will never be demonstrated through you until it's realized in you. And the first place the enemy attacks God's truth is in your mind, is in your heart. He comes with this seed of doubt. He comes with this seed to try to plant inside of our thinking because he knows seeds will grow. That lie is doing more damage than what you think it is. Every time you embrace a lie, you give it the power of truth. You see, when the enemy speaks to you, that word has absolutely no power to create reality until you do what? Agree to it. Because you empower what you agree with. You empower what you agree to. And here's the big thing. When the enemy speaks to you and you agree to that word, guess whose faith creates its reality? Yours. The enemy gets you to buy into a lie, but it's your faith that actually creates the reality of that lie. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful, listen to this, for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Listen to what it says. And we are taking every thought, everybody say, every thought. Every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Strongholds are developed in your thinking when you have ways of thinking that contradicts his truth. That's when strongholds are developed in us, is when we constantly embrace ways of thinking that contradicts his word. And the Bible says to take some thoughts captive. No. Oh, did it, does it just say take bad thoughts captive? Does it say just to take good thoughts captive? Oh, boy. You know how we tend to read this, this verse? That it's talking about just the bad thoughts. Do you realize sometimes positive thinking can be the enemy of, of godly thinking? This is more than thinking positive. This is actually thinking godly. If you just embrace positive thinking, then you'll be going to hell with a positive attitude. <laughs> but this right here, this entire Christian life is learning about submitting our mind to the mind of Christ. Where our, his thoughts literally become our thoughts. When we, when we open our mouth, our speech is literally his speech. Because we become so transformed by the truth of who he is. The reality you carry is determined by the level of truth you behold. And some of us are embracing truth that brings comfort to our soul, but not a solution to our problems. I was praying with a lady one time that had cancer, and the only truth that she would behold was the fact that God would never leave her or, or forsake her. That level of truth brought comfort to her, but it didn't provide a solution to her issue. And so it's not just about embracing truth, but it's about, it's about embracing the ultimate truth of Jesus Christ. Because truth comes in levels. Truth comes in layers. One truth creates the foundation for the next truth. And what happens so many times is we grow to a level of truth that brings comfort to us, but then we stop embracing truth that challenges us to grow. Did I just speak in tongues? I don't know. I was speaking really fast just then. If you're no longer being challenged in your Christian walk, then you have stopped embracing truth. If the way that you think now would keep you where God wants to take you, then you'll already be there. So then maybe we need to change the way that we think. 
then maybe we still need to embrace truth that creates a greater reality or creates a greater place of influence so that that truth is constantly challenged me where I am right now. Constantly say, no, this inside of you needs to shift. This inside of you needs to change. But maybe it's possible that we need to constantly embrace truth that causes us to grow. I'm just tired of listening to the lies of the enemy. I'm just tired of giving him a place of influence in my thinking. I'm just tired of allowing him to put these seeds of doubt in my mind that's destroying God's word, that's destroying my promise. You see, there's a place in God that you can be so hidden in Christ that Satan can no longer see you. You see, I want to be so filled and full of Jesus that when Satan looks at me, the only person he can see is Jesus Christ. The second way that our promises or truth is attacked is it's attacked externally. Circumstances. We briefly talked about circumstances up to this point. But I want to read a story to you that I think best illustrates this point. And it's found in the book of Mark chapter 4. And this is a story where Jesus and the disciples were on the boat, on a boat, and a storm was coming against this boat. And Jesus happens to be in the boat asleep. And let's see what happens in this account, picking up in verse 35. On on that day, when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd. They took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, which is what an external circumstance. And the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, to, said hush, be still. Come on now. And what, what happened? And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How many of us know fear is the enemy of faith? Fear is actually faith directed wrong. Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So we see here a story I think best illustrates how to handle circumstances. And so here's a story where Jesus and the disciples are in the boat. The storm comes against them, but the disciples, and they've been walking with Jesus for some time at this point, right? They've been seeing how Jesus handles situations, and they have not understood yet what Jesus has been trying to get them to understand what he came to teach them to do. Because Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. So what did, you, what, what did the Father send Jesus to do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. Come on. To walk a life full of power and authority. And so what happens is this circumstance is coming against them, and the disciples, instead of realizing what Jesus has been teaching them to do, they get afraid and fear. Fear will always cause you to run from your problems. Fear will always cause you to run away from your destiny. And in this moment, there was a situation that came up where God wanted to test inside of them the truth that he had deposited. And so the disciples, they they turn in fear from the issue, and they go to Jesus, and Jesus gets up and he does what? He rebukes them. Isn't that interesting? At some point as Christians, we have to take the diapers off. I'm really a nice guy. (laughs) Jesus rebukes the disciples. Why did he rebuke the disciples? Because they were asking him to do what he had already trained and empowered them to do. You see, Jesus was still asleep, I believe, because he was expecting the disciples to know how to handle the circumstance. He was expecting the disciples to be able to look at the storm and say, hush, be still.
You see, the enemy is going to come against you with circumstances. The thing is, have you learned how to speak to that circumstance instead of that circumstance speaking to you? Too many times we allow our circumstance to prophesy to us our truth instead of our truth prophesied to that circumstance. You see, what happened when the circumstance or the storm comes against the disciples, that storm begins to influence their thinking. That storm begins to prophesy to them their level of what they can accomplish. Oh boy, I don't know if we're getting this. That storm begins to prophesy to him the level of destiny they really had. That storm said, no, you can't do anything about me. But Jesus gets up and rebukes him. In my mind, Jesus is bald. Right? Because if I, if I was Jesus, I'd be like pulling all my hair out all the time. Because I get it. Every, I look at these stories, and that's the first thing I want to do is grab my head. Uh, and so I, I just know Jesus is like, oh, once again. And he rebukes them. Listen, for us as Christians, we, we, we've got to learn how to mature in Christ. And at some point, we must realize that we are co-laboring with him, that God doesn't want to just answer prayers for you. He wants to answer prayers through you, that he wants to be, he wants you to be the avenue which he flows through. When it's time for us to realize that we are the answer to, to the world's issues, we are God's response to the world's problems. We need to stop praying for revival and let revival flow through us. Oh. Listen, you can only go as far as your yes will allow Jesus to take you. I'm tired of allowing my circumstances to dwindle me down to this disarmed and defeated Christian. The only way that you can become a defeated Christian is if you allow it to happen. You start from the place of victory, not defeat. Listen, you start in a winning position. <laughs> you, you, you start on the top of Satan's head. So why are you going to allow him to get on top of yours? Okay. I don't have much time. I got to move on from this point. <laughs> the third way that, our, that the enemy attacks our promise or the truth of God is that the enemy attacks it with demonic strongholds. Demonic entities actually, actually come against us. It says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rules, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in what? The heavenly places. Luke chapter 10, verse 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority, come on now, over all the power of the enemy. So you've been given authority over all. You've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. There's nothing he can say or do that you don't have authority to stop. What happens is how demonic strongholds come against us and attack the God, God's word and his promises is that when the enemy comes against us, the enemy projects its state of being upon you. For example, if a spirit of fear is coming against you, what is the first emotion that you feel? Fear. That fear is not your fear. It's the fear of the enemy. The spirit itself is afraid. And so what happens is the enemy comes against you and it just projects upon you its state of being, hoping that it will convince you that it's your state of being. You see, I live in denial. When the enemy makes a request, I deny everything he says. <laughs> any fruit in my life, any fruit that I experience or any emotion that I experience that doesn't align with the fruits of the spirit, I reject them. 
Because I realize in that moment, it's the enemy trying to project an emotion upon me. Trying to project its state of being upon me. And so I'm not going to embrace any fruit that doesn't bear witness with the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, you may be, you may be depressed by, by, by the thoughts that you're entertaining. It, you may be depressed by the person that you're accepting. Oh, man. I hope I'm saying this right. You may be in fear simply because you have allowed the enemy to project itself upon you and, you, and convince you that that fear is yours. Listen, it's not yours. Listen, that depression is not yours. That anger, it's not yours. Are you getting it now? Listen, that sickness, that sickness, it's not yours. When you stop claiming the sickness, you may be able to step free from it. I actually preach a little more Pentecostal than this normally. I guess since I'm in a Pentecostal church, I need to get a little more, you know, calm down. I don't know. You have authority over all the power of the enemy. Why do you think the enemy works so hard to steal your authority? If, she, if Satan can influence your thoughts, then he can influence your identity. If he can influence your identity, he can come the, the, the dominant influence of your authority. I believe most of the works of the devil that he's doing today has been authorized by Christians. It's, it's Christians that have come under the influence of Satan, and now our authority given to us by God is under the dominion of Satan. <sighs> Look at the wilderness again. What was one of the temptations that the enemy came against Jesus with? He says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones. If he can cause Jesus to doubt who he was, then he can cause Jesus to come under his influence and therefore be the instrument to establish his works on earth. <laughs> we'll kick the door in in a minute. Did that make sense? I'm tired of authorizing the works of the devil. It's time for me to understand who I am as a son, who I am as a daughter, and understand that my authority is designed to destroy the works of the devil, not reinforce them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus came for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So why am I going to try to reinforce them? I have been divinely equipped and assigned to destroy the works of the devil. Listen, I want the devil when he sees me to turn in fear. I want him when he sees me to say, ah, I'm leaving this guy alone and run off. The Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 7, resist the devil and he will what? It says submit therefore to God first though, doesn't it? You see, the level of your submission determines the level of your resistance. Let me ask you, is Satan running to you or from you? Because the word says, if, I, am I, if I'm fully submitted to the, to the reign of Christ, the enemy will flee from me. Why? Because I am not a place of influence for the enemy. You see, the enemy is only interested in people he can influence. If he cannot influence you, he will run and flee from you. Oh, man, I have a long way to go. I, want, <laughs> I like you. I'll pay you for these comments afterwards. <laughs> what I want to do now, because the next message that I want to get to is really the one that I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but before I get to that message, I do want to share with you some principles of how to partner with God's word. And just, I've talked to you how to how to expose the works of Satan so that you can identify them when they come against you with three specific ways that he attacks us. But now I want to show you how to partner with the promises of God. And I want to do, the, do so with a story of a man named Zacharias and a woman named Elizabeth, who are the father and mother of who? 
What's interesting to me about the story that we're going to read is that Zacharias is doing his priestly duties at this time, and he actually has an angelic visitation. Any, would anybody like to have an angelic visitation? It's amazing, right? And this angel comes to Zacharias with a prophetic promise, with a prophetic word. But I want us to evaluate and look at how Zacharias responds to the word. It may be different than what you think. And we'll pick it up here in verse 11. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. You think you'd be troubled a little bit if an angel appeared? <laughs> Wouldn't know what to do, right? And fear gripped him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. In other words, he's been, he's been petitioning for something. He's been crying out for something. He's been praying for something, right? And let me see. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. This is what the angel says. He will bear you. I mean, she will bear you a son. And you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner, come on now, before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and disobedient to the attitudes of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, is this a powerful prophetic word? Woo! I, I just got excited reading about that. I wonder what Zacharias' response to this prophetic word is. Would you like to know? Let's look at it together here. Zacharias said to the angel, how will I know this is for certain? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, really, dude? An angel appears to you. An angel appears to you, gives you a prophetic word, and you're like, how am I going to know this is for certain? <laughs> this is a man of God. This is a priest. He, he, he needs to know God, right? And, and he, his first response to an angel, listen, an angel. An angel, if an angel appeared to you, brother, what would you do? Would you believe his words, right? And let's move on right here and see what continues to happen. <laughs> How will I know this is for certain? And then he explains to the angel why the promise cannot happen. He says, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. So the angel gives him a word. He first questions the words, how will I know this is for certain? Then he, then he tries to tell the angel how the word is not going to happen. Let, okay, let me, Jesus, I'm going to tell you why what you just said doesn't make sense. It's not going to work because I'm an old man. My wife was, oh, there's no way we're going to have a kid. That's basically what he's saying to God. He's like, listen, God, you, you're not bigger than, than my age. <laughs> How many times we say that to God? He's not bigger than our circumstance. Anyway. The angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> but that's the way I picture him saying that, right? Gabriel, who, listen, th then the angel has to justify himself to Zacharias. He says, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Like now the angel has to be all defensive and like, well, let me just explain to you who I am. Obviously, you don't get it. You know? Oh, man. He says, and I have been sent to you to speak to you and bring you this good news. But listen what, what Gabriel goes on to say. And behold, you shall not be, you shall be unable to speak. Oh, man. Until the day which these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Wow. Wow. This angel appears to Zacharias, gives him this amazing prophetic word, and he starts attacking this. There's no way this can happen. I'm an old man. And then the angel has to justify himself to Zacharias. But then he makes some very interesting statements. He says, you will not be able to speak because you did not believe my words. But immediately we see two principles right here of how to partner with God's word, how to partner with God's promises. Number one, you have to believe the word. So let me talk about that just for a moment. 
the Bible verse that Kenneth Hagin wrote, okay, no one got that just then. That's fine. That's okay. But the Bible does say that whatever we pray for believing we have received it, it shall be ours, right? Now, I don't have time to go into, go into the flip side of that when people, you know, claim it and grab it and whatever you call it. I don't even know. I tried it once. It didn't work, so I decided not to go that route. I actually bought a lottery ticket one time. I was like, Two million dollars right now in Jesus' name, <laughs> right? <laughs> like I had already planned out where all my money's going. I'm tithing to this church, and anyway, I don't want to go there. I was a young, I was a young minister at the time. <laughs> but the point that I want to bring out from that passage of scripture is that faith operates from the place of completion. In other words, faith operates from the finished work toward your present. It, it, it operates from the future toward your present moment. Faith actually causes you to see the divine perspective. It causes you to see the finished work of what Christ has already provided. So let me ask you, Isaiah 53, 5, by his wounds you are healed. Do you see yourself healed? Amen. If you... If you don't see yourself healed, then you may not get there. Because you can only go in the direction that you can see. Some of us cannot see beyond our circumstance and we wonder why we can't get beyond the circumstance. Because we cannot allow faith to see beyond it. You see, faith is this component that operates from the place of completion. So if, I, if we do not allow our faith to operate from its proper place, then what kind of fruit are we going to receive from it? Listen, some of us only see our promises as a futuristic event. And we wonder why that promise is never brought into our present because our faith keeps it in the future. I didn't say, I said that faith saw from the future. I didn't say faith kept things in the future. There's a difference. If you could only see the promise is something far off and away from you, guess what? You're, you're posturing your faith in an illegal position. Okay, I don't even know I just said that right. You're posturing your faith in its wrong position. And it's not allowing you to receive the promise God wants to give you. You see, we have to learn to believe his word, believe his promises, because faith operates from that place of completion. Faith is constantly bringing a divine connection between the future promise and the present assignment and moment. And it's causing you and the promise to come together. Yeah. You see... Faith sees from the futures. So you, you can act by faith, you can actually see the tactics of Satan that's coming your way. <sighs> Would it be nice to know what the enemy's gonna do before he does it? Wouldn't it be nice to be so rooted in God that when you saw, you saw from that future to where you are right now, and, but you also saw every tactic that the enemy wanted to come against you with in that process of bringing together promise to present. I had a prophetic dream one time. And in this dream, I was walking up this long highway. And at the end of... The highway was this huge, beautiful castle. And I saw in it the demons sitting on the, on the lawn of this castle, and they were squatting like this. And in the dream, the Lord says, they're squatters. We all know the definition of a squatter, right? Depending on the state that you're in, if someone is illegally on your property and you do nothing about it, over a period of time, whose land does it become? You see, faith causes you to see the squatters on your land. And when I got to my castle, see, God picked me up in this dream. He took me all the way to my castle, and he says, now I want you by faith to kick them off your land. And so guess what? I, in the dream, I started to walk around kicking them in the butt. Like, could I say butt in church? I don't know. I just did. I repent. 
But I walked around like, get off my land, get off my land, get off my land, until I cleared all the demonic spirits off my promise. What do you see? The Bible says for we are to walk by faith, not by sight, because faith sees. Faith sees into the dimension in which your natural eyes cannot see into. Faith sees into the dimension of the finished work of Christ, into the finished product in which your natural eyes cannot see into. It's time for us stop, to stop looking through our natural senses and start looking through our spiritual sense, and it's called faith, and start allowing that faith to influence our thinking, to influence our perspective, to influence our vision, so we no longer have a worldview based on CNN or Fox News, but we have a worldview based on the Word of God. Listen, if you don't wake up to good news, then you're waking up to the wrong news. Because you wake up to the gospel. The next thing this angel says to Zacharias is, I'm not going to allow you to say a word. You're not going to be able to speak because this will happen. That's very interesting to me because I often wonder... Would the promise, would the prophetic promise had come about if Zechariah would have been able to speak? Do you realize the significance of John the Baptist? Do you realize the message that he came to carry? He came with a forerunner message to usher in a person, and the person was Jesus. If Zechariah could have been able to speak, I believe he would have destroyed his own divine purpose. You see, the words you're speaking are having an effect on the reality you're creating. It says in Proverbs that we will eat from the product, we will eat the fruit from the product of our lips. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. You see, I'm tired of prophesying my problems and stepping into them. Some of us have issues simply because our language, language is creating those issues. What if we were so filled with truth that truth was off the, off the lips of our tongue, off, came off of our lips? What if we allow truth to become the prophetic word that we spoke and that truth created reality? What if we so allow God's word to get so inside of us that everything that came from our lips was in alignment with his purpose, was in alignment with his truth, was in alignment with his mind, was in alignment with his will? What if? Okay, I'm getting a little excited now. Those conversations that you have at work are doing more damage than what you think. Those gossiping conversations are doing more damage than what we think. The condemning of our nation is doing more damage than what we think. The condemning of our neighbor is doing more damage than what we think. The, the condemning of ourselves is doing more damage than what we think. I literally sometimes have to look in the mirror and prophesy to myself. And when I have to look in the mirror and prophesy to myself, I know I have begun to see from a different lens that's perverted. It's time for our speech, our vocabulary to align to God's mind and word. The last Thing that you can do to partner with promises, partner with the word of God is identify what the promise requires of you. What does it require? If I want to become a doctor but all I do is sit at home and play the PlayStation then guess what? I'm not going to get there. In other words, a promise always has a process of assignment. A promise, always has, a promise always has a process in which that promise is causing you to walk out. It's telling you to walk this thing out. I'm standing before you today because I embraced a process of my promise. You see, you're looking at someone that spent the first 
six months of his Christian life preaching to no one but the walls. Listen, when I had my encounter with God, I was so filled with divine purpose in that moment because my created being just discovered my creator. And in one moment, I came into the reality of what I was designed for. And it was a design to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. You listen, you don't understand how much of a miracle it is for me to be standing right here. But it is. And when I, I didn't wait for the promise to come before I started acting on it. Oh, boy. Some of you are waiting for an anointing to come before you step out, but God's waiting for you to step out so the anointing can come. The level of your trust determines the level of your obedience. Some of us have believed our promise and declared our promise, but we haven't trusted the promise to be obedient to what it requires. And for me... The promise required for me to live my life in a way that I'm not going to be get rooted down in any particular state, city. Listen, I live my life in a way that I can uproot and leave right now because that's the call of my life. And listen, I was a pastor for eight years, and I still live my life that way. I always try to live my life in a way that I can uproot and move out into what God had called me to. Because I don't want to become so defined by my work for God that it becomes the voice I listen to instead of God itself. Okay, I don't know if we just got that. It's 11.30. I need to move on here. And so this first message that I've been speaking on is the basis of our faith in Christ, our faith in his promises, and how we co-labor with those things. But do you realize that faith in Christ is based on your ability, but the faith of Christ is based on his? And so right now, as I want to talk to you about the faith of Christ... Specifically, I've titled this message, Believe Like Jesus. Would you like to believe like Jesus? Yes. What would our life be like if we literally had his faith? What would our Christian life be like if we literally was able to believe like Jesus? Turn, to me, turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has given to every man a measure of faith. I like the King James Version, actually. It says, God has given to every man the measure of faith. Now, whatever... Your perspective on this issue is there are two things that we have to realize in this verse. Number one, who gave faith to you? So what would faith be considered? So if it's a gift, then it can it be earned by your striving? You see, the faith of God is, to re is received, not achieved. The faith of Christ is received, not achieved. The next thing I have, you have to see in this verse is that God gives faith to you. The next question you have to ask, we all have to ask this question, whose faith did he give us? <laughs> God gives to you out of who he is, not out of who you are. God gives, you, gives to you his ability, not your ability. <sighs> okay. I thought it would go over about like that. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 says, but to each one of us, everybody say each one of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Then it goes on to list fivefold ministry. But what I want to point out is right here, it says, the grace given to us to the measure of who? Christ. Christ. Everything God gives to you is to the measure of Jesus. Jesus is your starting point. 
Jesus is the foundation in which you are to start from, not strive to attain to. For some of us, the only understanding that we need right here is to realize that the very faith that you actually have is the faith given to you by God, which is the ability of God already deposited inside of you. So how do we learn now to partner with the faith of Christ that's already been deposited inside of us? I would like to share some of those with you. Would you like that? Yes. Have you been enjoying this morning so far? Yes. Some of you look like you're going to sleep on me. No. I don't know. I need to give you some coffee. The first thing of how we can cooperate with the faith of Christ is by fully yielding to Jesus. Let me read a verse to you, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is Paul speaking, and I want you to listen to, to what he says. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Does he say he might be? We, once again, we as Christians spiritualize this, these scriptures to a point it can no longer be actualized in our life. Because we understand in spirit we have been crucified, right? But I don't think the Apostle Paul was only speaking in that sense. I think he was literally saying, I am crucified with Christ. You need to catch this. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh most translations say this, I live by the faith in the Son of God, but the King James, I, believe, I think, best gives the context of this, and I don't use King James very often. It says this, but the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. <sighs> Who loved me and gave himself for me. As you learn to yield to Jesus, you'll learn for the faith of Jesus to be demonstrated through you. This entire Christian life is learning how to rest in his ability to perform, his ability to produce. This Christian life is designed in such a way that we have to learn how to yield in the presence of Jesus. Listen, to the degree that you yield to Jesus is to the degree that you'll live like Jesus. And we wonder why we're not looking like him because we're not yielding to the... Oh, boy. Why do you think Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, therefore become a living sacrifice? Why do you think it says a living sacrifice? Because you have to choose to remain on the altar. You have to choose to remain on the altar of sacrifice. He's made you a living sacrifice. He says, listen, it's still up to you to yield in what I've given to you or you can step out of it. I want to live my life in a way that I'm so yielded to Jesus that everything that I do, everywhere that I go, Jesus is oozing out of me. That when I go into places, it's his faith being demonstrated through me. Come on. I really want us to get this this morning. John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven, this is Jesus speaking, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus came to role model the life and, life, the life and lifestyle of a believer. If he yielded his will, what do you think we are called to do? Yield our will. When you yield your will, you'll pick up his. My wife loves to do street ministry. A couple of weeks ago, she had a prophetic art card. And someone told her that to take this art card and, you know, go and prophesy over somebody with it in the streets. And it was around lunchtime. And listen, I am a, my, my love language is food. Like right now, some of your heads are turning into hamburgers. <laughs> like I don't even know what I'm saying at this point. I just hope it's godly, you know. I'm playing, I'm playing. And we were close by Chick-fil-A. Come on, it's a Christian organization. Oh, 
That's the only place I can get fried chicken now, man. What's up? And my wife has this art card, and she's like, well, William, I, I feel like we need to go right now and, and, and prophesy and pray for somebody. And, and, and to be honest with you, in that moment, the only thing I'm thinking about is a combo number three. <laughs> can I just be real? The only thing I'm thinking about is those waffle fries. I'm dipping it inside the Chick-fil-A sauce. I'm pouring that Chick-fil-A sauce over everything, over my cup, and just lick it off. In that moment, in that moment right there, I didn't feel like yielding to the will of God. I didn't feel like yielding to Jesus. In, in, in that moment, I, I wanted to yield to my fleshly desires. <laughs> and, and the bad thing is, I, like, Chick-fil-A is in front of us. Like, we're going toward Chick-fil-A. I'm like, babe, could you have said this, like, 10 miles down the road or something? Well, I cannot, I'm not seeing the prophetic promise. <laughs> you know? And as we're getting as we're getting close to Chick-fil-A, my anxiety is increasing. I'm like, oh man, this is really happening. I'm not gonna eat my Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> and before I know it, Chick-fil-A is in my rear view mirror, and I'm like, mm. look at in my rear view mirror. Ah! I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir. I God bless. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm joking with that. I'm a good driver. And sure enough, we get past Chick-fil-A. My wife says, stop at this, this, this store right here. We're going to go in and prophesy. Oh, okay, good. She's going to do it. Because <laughs> to be honest, I, I'm, no, I'm in no mood to be praying for people. You know, I'm in no mood to prophesy with someone. I don't know what may come out. I may strangle them. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. And so we, we pull up to this store, and the, my wife hands the card over to me and says, now you go in and prophesy. And I'm like, oh, man. On the outside, I'm like full of faith. But on the inside, I'm like, why? Get behind me, these Satan. Hope my, my wife's not in here, thank God. And so, um, and so then I have this choice to make. What am I going to do in this moment? Am I going to change my agenda to pick up God's or am I going to yield to my agenda to pick up my will? Okay, I don't know what you're saying. And so I said, okay, give me the art card. <laughs> it's the anger of the Lord that brings us to repentance right now. <laughs> And so I walk up to the door, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, what I'm going to do, this is, I'm, no prayers went into this whatsoever. I said, I'm just going to open the door, and the first person that I see, I'm going to give them this card and say, praise God, hallelujah, have a good day. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so I open the door, and you're like, all angry and stuff, you know. <laughs> like, it, this is not a good evangelistic tool. Like, I'm already kind of having an intense look on my face anyway, so I'm walking in like, mm, who wants Jesus? <laughs> not good. Not good at all. Bad situation. And so I, I walk in, sure enough, I see this lady sitting there. I walk right over to her. And as soon as I hand the art card to her, the Holy Ghost takes over. The Holy Ghost takes over. I begin to prophesy. As I'm prophesying to her, she begins to weep right there on the spot. And she just comes undone right there in her seat at her job. Her, her co-worker is sitting right beside her and says, you have absolutely no idea what you're saying to her right now in the situation that she's in. You, what the words that you're speaking right now are changing her right now. You just don't know it. Would I have missed the will of God if I hadn't yielded my agenda? If you want to pick up the agenda of God, then you must first have to learn to yield your agenda to his. And if you want the faith of Jesus demonstrated through you, then you must learn to yield your agenda to his. And when you yield your ability to his ability, all of a sudden, faith, the faith of Christ is demonstrated through you. I was a youth pastor for some time. I was a really good youth pastor, by the way. <laughs> like, my kids love God. Well, this one particular day, I was, I was taking them doing some street ministry and stuff. And, and at this time, I had got, like, I don't want to see people with back pain healed anymore. I want to see people get out of wheelchairs or something, you know. And I want my kids to see it. And, and so we go to this huge mall uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I break my groups up into groups of two and three. And I have a group with me. And I, and I tell them, listen, we're only looking for people that, that, that look like they might die. You know, we're only looking for people that's in wheelchairs and stuff like that. You know, that's what we're going after right now. And, 
And after I make, I make this, this statement comes out of my mouth, and I look, and there's a man in a wheelchair. And I'm like, oh, man, rubber is meeting the road right now. And so I'm like, well, I've already said it now. I'm in this situation. I'm going to have to do something. And so I take my kids over to Scott. I strike up a conversation with him. And all of a sudden, he says, well, I've been paralyzed from the waist down for the past 22 years. And my faith was like, bye, and takes off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever tried to pray for someone when they get through talking, they've talked you into doubt? Like, there's no more faith left in your body. And that's how I was, right? I'm like, oh, the first person I'm talking to is paralyzed from the waist down. All my faith is gone. And, I, and then me and this guy get into an argument. I was like, well, God, God can heal you. And he's like, no, he can't. I'm like, yes, he can. No, he can't. I'm like, okay, wisdom not, is not on me right now. <laughs> I said, well, at least let my kids pray for you. That way, if nothing happens, it's on them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, that's what we do. And so my kids, my kids circle around this guy in the wheelchair, and they, they begin to lay hands, and I'm standing in front of him, directly in front of him like this. They lay hands on him, begin to pray, and all of a sudden, this is the strangest thing ever happened. In this moment, I, I don't feel the faith of God. I don't feel anything. In this moment, I might, you know, I'm somewhere else in my mind. But in this moment, my right arm begins to shake. In this moment, I'm like, William, don't get Pentecostal in this moment. <laughs> don't get Pentecostal in this moment. You know, we, have, we all have these Pentecostal friends. You're like, your door greeters, right? And they meet you at the door and they like, ah, 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 praise God, hallelujah. I love Pentecostal. I am one. But I'm in the mall and like my, my hand's beginning to shake. And then the next thing happens is straight. And listen, I'm not doing this. Like, my, I'm not having... I'm not doing, making my arm shake. And all of a sudden, my hand begins to move toward his hand. And I'm like, in my mind, like, ah! ah! Like a kid, you know, screaming on the inside of me. Like, oh, oh, don't grab his hand. Don't grab his hand. Don't grab his hand! <laughs> Guess what happens? I grab his hand. I'm like, I'm watching my hand move toward his hand. Then I watch my hand grab his hand. I'm like, please do not pull. Please do not. Please do not pull! Sure enough, I, my arm jerks him like this right here. He gets, he leans out of the wheelchair. The power of God hits him. The muscles that were astrophied, come on now, gain strength. Feeling comes into his legs. He begins to walk in the mall. He, he begins to walk in the mall. Praise to God. He's just weeping, you know. He's just weeping. And at this time, like 100 people gather around us, you know, they're, they're looking at us and stuff and watching this. And all of a sudden, I see two security guards coming toward me. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be really good or really bad, you know. And they walk at me and say, sir, you cannot do this stuff here. You got, you've got to get out of here. And they grab me by the arm and throw me out of the mall. And I'm like, I didn't get a chance to get this guy's information, talk to him or nothing. I'm, I'm, I, later on, I was thinking, I said, he probably thinks I'm just some good-looking bald angel that appeared to him. <laughs> Like, he's probably going around somewhere, and I met Jesus. Jesus is bald, man. Did you know that? <laughs> My kids go berserk. They start praying for people all over the mall. I mean, people getting healed, saved, healed, delivered. For six months, my kids on their own were doing street ministry five to six times a week. I'm talking about healing, power, miracles happening. But the point that I'm trying to make is in that moment, it wasn't my faith that was in operation. It was the faith of Christ operating through me because I yielded to Jesus himself. Oh, boy. Listen. If you just put yourself in that situation, if you just step out and say, God, I'm going to trust you, because like John Wimber said, right, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If you just put yourself in that situation and say, I'm yielding to you right now. I don't understand it. I don't feel like I have faith. I don't feel like I have courage, but I am choosing to trust you. I'm choosing to trust your personhood. I'm choosing to trust your truth. And when you put yourself in that moment, his faith, his ability <laughs> operates through you. So the faith of Christ is a byproduct of yielding to Christ. The next way that we can cooperate with the faith of God <coughs> is by hearing his voice. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, 
So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It says faith comes by hearing, which means there's a present tense relationship going on. Then it says the word of Christ. It's not just talking about written scripture. It's talking about the spoken word of Christ. It means what? I'm in communion with Jesus. I'm in communion with the Father and the words that are coming out of his mouth are those words that create faith. You see the faith of God you see the, the voice of God activates the faith of God in you. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I get a little crazy sometimes. It's the voice of God that activates the faith of Christ inside of you. So if, if faith comes by hearing, how do you think doubt comes? By hearing the wrong voice. Let me ask you, whose voice are you listening to? The voice of God would never lead you into a place of unbelief. So if you're in a place of unbelief, then the wrong voice led you there. Come on, that's good. I remember when I first started learning how to hear the voice of God. Every night I would go to sleep and I would play worship music. And you know how you have CDs and you have your CD player. I mean, I was young, so it's not like MP3 stuff now. It's not like iTunes or iPhone or whatever. But I would always go to sleep, listen to this worship CD. Every single night about 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, I, was, I would be woken up with the chipmunks singing to me. You know, like Alvin and the chipmunks? I mean, I would wake up. I mean, it was the chipmunks singing to me. And I would wake up every morning. I'm like, God, what are you, what are you trying to say to me? The chipmunks are singing. You know, like, and every night, this went on for like two weeks, you know. I'm like, I'm trying to decide, like, is this God speaking to me? What, what's going on right now? And then it would, it would do it for a few minutes, and it would just stop. And the, and the worship music would play again. <laughs> After a couple of weeks, my friend was over at my house, and I was like, man, I started telling him about this story. I said, you know what? Every night I, am, I, I'm wake, I wake up in my bed with the chipmunk singing to me. I don't know if it's God, God speaking to me. I don't know what's going on. But I'm trying to learn how to hear his voice. Listen, if you limit how you hear, you limit what you hear. Some of you can't hear the voice of God because you put him inside of this box of the only way he can speak to you. And the reason he appears to be silent because he's speaking to you outside of the box in which you put him in. Anyways, a side note. So I open myself up to hear the voice any way he speaks to me. That's why I'm open to the chipmunk singing to me and I can hear God. I'm not crazy. And so I start telling my friend about the chipmunk singing to me and he says, What's going on in your room? I said, well, I, put, I always put my CD in. I play my CD at night. He says, man, the chipmunks are not singing to you. Your CD is skipping. <laughs> I'm like, my CD is skipping. I'm like, I'm trying to, have to discover this spiritual enlightenment, you know. And the whole time, my CD is skipping. And so that night, sure enough, it starts going. The chipmunks start singing. I get up. I'm going to see if he's right. And I walk over to it, and sure enough, my CD skipping. <laughs> but that's the moment he spoke to me, that, that phrase I just gave you. If you limit how you hear, you limit what you hear. After that experience right there, right there, after I opened myself up to hear his voice in any way that he wants to speak to me, me and my friend were doing street ministry, and his name is Woody. Anybody ever saw the, 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 the Toy Story, the movie Toy Story? My friend, his, name, his, his name's Woody, just like Woody on Toy Story. And he looks just like Woody on Toy Story. <laughs> like, when we were kids, I'm like, man, I have the real life Woody with me, man. Because we've been best friends, you know, our whole life. And, well, we were doing street ministry, and he was driving. We were actually on our way back home, and he was driving the car. And Woody's one of those type people, you know, he's kind of absent-minded. We all have friends like that, right? Just kind of, you know, up in space somewhere. And he's always talking, and I'm always acting like I'm listening. And <laughs> Baby, I do not do that for you. That's my wife I'm speaking to. And so Woody is just blabbing on. He's just talking. He's, he's driving. We're going home. And all of a sudden, I see a black bird fly by my window. A black bird, you know. And all of a sudden, I see this black bird fly by my window, and I hear, I hear in my mind, direction to death. And so I look over to Woody, and I'm like, man, 
I just saw this black bird fly by the window, and I just heard the Lord say direction to death. I was expecting Woody to just go on home. Guess what Woody does? Woody turns the car around. I'm, Woody starts turning around. I'm like, Woody, Woody, what, Woody, Woody, what are we doing, Woody? He said, we're going to follow the bird. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're going bird watching now. I'm like, oh my, I'm like, really? Are we really following birds right now? Talking about we're following Jesus, you know? And just, just follow, don't crucify me or th- write me off yet. Just hear me out. I'm not crazy. I don't think. And so we get behind this, this black bird, and this bird is flying perfectly over the highway. And it's, I mean, it's literally like it has turn signals and everything. It's like, I'm going, I'm going to the left, I'm going to the right. I mean, it's, it's weird. And this bird flies right over our home and lands in a tree. And it has, this home has a long driveway, driveway. So we get on this driveway, and we're going up to this home. And there's a man standing on the porch with a gun in his hand. And I look at Woody, I said, man, we just heard the devil. It's directed to our death, man. Let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm from Alabama. Everybody has guns, you know. And Woody's like, he, he doesn't care. He's just going for it, you know. And we, we pull up, and I'm like, man, I, I don't want Woody to talk to him because you never know what Woody's going to say. He, whatever pops in his head, it just comes out of his mouth. You know, we have friends like that, right? Why do we have husbands like that? Don't raise your hand. Anyway. And so Woody pulls up right in front of this guy. He has this gun in his hand, and he begins to roll the window down. I'm like, William, you better hurry up and say something now. Woody's about to talk. And so he gets the window down. I say, excuse me, sir. The Lord sent us here because someone is dealing with death. Immediately he drops his gun on the porch and begins to weep. We get out of the car. We walk up on the porch. The power of God just all around this guy. You can feel it. I says, what's going on? He says, my son is five years old, and he's dying of pneumonia in the hospital. I said, well, God sent us here to pray for your son because he's going to heal him. I said, let me tell you how we got here. (laughs) Now, that's going to go really good or really bad in that moment. (laughs) Yes, we just followed followed a black bird to your house. We're full of wisdom and revelation. (laughs) No, I didn't say that. But I told him how we got there. And we begin to pray with him as we're praying. I, I, I know the details later because I found out later. As we're praying for him, at the same time, the power of God is touching his son in the hospital and healing his son of pneumonia. Oh, I don't know if we just get, I don't know, but I don't know if we're getting this. It was all because we said, I am going to yield to Jesus and his faith is going to be demonstrated through me. The apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Let me ask you, have you been crucified? Have you died so that Jesus can live? Oh, think about that. He died so that you can live, but will you die so that he can live through you? At this point, man, me and Woody feel like we can walk on water. Like our face is like, man, give me some pond to walk across. Like me and Woody, we, we, we literally did this. We used to practice walking on water. All right, when Jesus did it, we can do it too. You know, we walk, we, we practice, just go off in the mud puddle. We, we, we would even practice walking through walls. Okay, I just lost some of you there. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's okay. We can, we can be fun with Jesus. Like, me and my friend, what do we like? We, we, we would pray, like, okay, let's close our eyes and walk to this wall. Boom! <laughs> and fall on the floor. I'm like, Jesus walked through the wall when he was talking with Thomas. You know, he walked through the wall. Yes. We can do it. And so me and Woody are like, man, we can do this. I was like, what do you want to do, Woody? He says, let's, let's, let's follow another bird. <laughs> there he is. There he is. That's Woody. <laughs> you see his personality, right? Thank you for doing that, babe. That's the type, that's his personality. He's just fun, you know? And so me and Woody get in the car, and guess what we see? We see the bird again. And Woody's like, let's do it. <laughs> and so we get behind, we get, we get, sure enough, we get on the road, we're driving down the highway, just, I'm going right, you know, and, it, and the bird starts turning down roads and stuff, and sure enough, it flies over another home with a lady on the front porch sitting and crying. We get out of the car, we walk over to us, and he says, excuse us, we, God has sent us here because someone is dealing with death. 
She said, I just lost my husband and my son in a car accident in the past six months. I don't think God loves me. I said, well, let me tell you how me and Woody got here. And I shared with her the story. And by the end of the story, she says, you know what? God has to love me to send two crazy dudes to follow a bird to my house to tell me that he loves me, to show his love to me, to show his compassion. I don't know if we're getting this. I don't know. Jesus. She gives her life to Jesus right there on the spot. We just sat there and hug her and cry with her for about an hour. We get ready to leave. She says, my next door neighbor is a pastor, and he's, he's dying of an incurable disease. Would you have trusted to follow that bird? We go over to the neighbor's house. We knock on the door. The pastor's wife opens the door. We say, we, f we heard that your, your husband is dying of a disease. Me and my friend Woody has come here. We feel like God wants to heal him today. She looks at me in the eyes and says, we do not believe in healing. And shut the door in my face. <clears throat> the only person that wasn't open to the movement of the spirit was the Christian. We wonder why the world doesn't want to come to our church. We wonder why the world doesn't want to come in. I'm not talking about this church specifically. I'm not saying that. We wonder why the world is afraid to come into the place that we say we have faith, that we say we believe Jesus. But we, as the very representations of Christ, are the ones that are afraid of him. <sighs> Are the ones that are afraid for him to move? Are the ones that are afraid for him to touch people, to heal people, to deliver people? Why are we as Christians afraid for God to invade our house of prayer and worship? And in that moment when the Christian said no to me, I come to the realization that the world is craving for Jesus. And we as representations of Jesus need to demonstrate him. Listen, the world is way more supernatural than what we are. The world is way more open to this movement of the spirit than what we are sometimes. Romans chapter 8, what does it say? For all of creation is, awaiting for the, is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Listen, all of creation is waiting for you to be revealed. All of creation is waiting for you to know that you're a son, to know that you're a daughter, and to go out and say, I'm carrying him. The faith of Jesus is just a byproduct of yielding to, G to Jesus. Are you willing to yield? Are you willing to hear his voice? When he speaks, do you act? I love what Dr. Clark said last night. He said, I'd rather fail by trying than in disobedience. The only way that you can grow in hearing the voice of God is by acting on what you believe he's saying to you. If you're waiting for this supernatural sense to come upon you to act, you'll never begin to step out into his faith. But when he speaks to you and you say, I, I partner with that word, I believe that word, all of a sudden that word becomes the empowerment that you need to walk it out because that word itself demonstrates itself through you. Is this okay this morning? The next way that we can partner with the faith of Christ is by studying his word. It's by getting his word inside of you. I remember, let me say this, 2 Timothy 
All scripture is breathed out by who? God. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. May be complete. That the man of God, man, the woman of God may be complete. You see, the written word is always there to transform you into the image of Jesus. I remember when I first gave my life to the Lord, and at the time, listen, I love TV. I love college football because I am from the South, and I would watch TV all, like, all the time. And so one day I said, I'm going to go on a 40-day fast from TV, and I'm just going to study the Bible for 40 days. Really, I, I didn't realize how much time I had to read the Bible. <laughs> Some of us are like, I don't have any time to read the Bible. And we're steadily watching TV. And so my life becomes so transformed over those 40 days. I become, the truth of God became so alive inside of me over those 40 days. That at the end of those 40 days, I called Dish Network. I'm like, listen, I, I don't think I want TV anymore. And you know they're trained to give an answer to any problem that you have, right? And they was like, well, sir, why, why is it that you don't need a TV anymore? And I said, well, I've just fasted TV for 40 days. I've been reading the Bible and encountering the God of it. I don't need it anymore. And it was like nothing on the other end. Like, <laughs> it was like, grr, 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 no response. You know, I, ha I have no answer for this. And she says, well, okay. <laughs> and, then, and then we hang up a phone, and then I go four years without watching TV. Amen. And over the course of those four years, I spend eight to ten hours every day studying his word. Getting his word inside of me because his word perfects me to the image of Christ. Yes. The written word teaches you and trains you to identify the spoken word. Let me read another passage to you here because I need to hurry up through some of this. Ephesians 4 says this, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Listen to this. For the building up of the body of Christ until we all, everybody say all. all. Attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and the, uh, the mature manhood, manhood to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Whew. Wow. Once again, don't spiritualize this. Christ has called us to become the mature person of Jesus on this earth. To become a pure, pure, mature demonstration of who he is to the people of this world. When people see you, do they see Jesus? When people encounter you, do they encounter Jesus? When they encounter you, who do they encounter? Someone that needs their butt white. Okay. Let's move on here. <laughs> to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, so that, listen to this, so that we would no longer be tossed to and fro by the waves carried out by the wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Listen to what it goes on to say here. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Into Christ. Come on. From the whole body, joined and held together to every joint, joint which is equipped when each part is working properly, everybody say working properly, <laughs> makes the body grow that it builds itself up in love. Whoa. It says so that every part operates properly so that the whole of the body can mature in love. Listen, that lie you're beholding is doing damage to the body of Christ. You're so significant that the body is incomplete without your expression of God. The, the body of Christ is incomplete without you. The body of Christ is incomplete uh, without you becoming the mature son of God, the mature daughter of God demonstrated on this earth. Listen, the body of Christ is dependent upon you to mature in him. <sighs> listen, listen. Everyone is born an original, but most of us die a copy. 
The desire to be someone else is the failure to realize our own significance in Christ. Listen, you're horrible at being somebody else, but you're wonderful at being you. I don't want to be anybody else but the person that God has designed and equipped me to be. Listen, when you finally realize your significance, you'll begin to embrace your divine purpose. You'll begin to operate in the personhood that God has created you to be. It's time that we discover our own originality. The creator created you to be a creative expression of him. By nature, you're creative. By nature, your created being is unique in the sense that nobody else carries an aspect of Jesus the way that you can carry it. And we wonder why there's so many watered-down versions of Jesus in the world. Because there's men and women that haven't realized their own significance and we come constantly compare ourselves to other people. Listen, comparison is the sacrifice of contentment. You no longer become content with who God designed you to be as long as you're comparing yourself to somebody else because you always compare your weakness to their strength. The reason you're weak is because you're embracing their strength. <sighs> did, you, did you hear me just then? The reason that you're weak because you're desiring to be someone you're not. <sighs> I feel this thing in me like, like fire in my bones. I feel this inside of me, this surging in my body because God is truth. <sighs> it's time that we embrace the person that God has created us to be. It's time that we allow the word of God to so transform us into the image of Christ, into the uniqueness of our originality because no one else can be us. No one else can be you. You're so, 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 so significant. You need to hear, some of us need to hear this right now. Listen, the body needs you to be built up in maturity. The body needs you right now to realize who he has created you to be so that the rest of us can operate in fullness. I can preach on this for... A long time. The next way that we can cooperate with the faith of Christ is by witnessing his works. His works will produce in you his faith. Witnessing his miraculous power will cause something inside of you to begin to rise. Have we not been seeing it over the past couple of days? How many people in here right now you're just in this session, but you've been healed over the past two, couple of days. Come on. Wow. Come on, let's praise Jesus for that. Let me, let me share a story with you in Matthew chapter 9. This is a story of a woman that has a hemorrhage of blood. And one thing I want you to realize is, and understand is this right here. He, she just touches the hinge of Jesus' cloak and gets healed. Verse 20 says, And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Let me ask you, whose faith did he see in her? I would like to suggest to you, that she had been watching Jesus over the days, over the weeks, or whatever it may have been. She had been hearing the stories of what Jesus had been doing. She had been seeing the miracles with her own eyes of what he was performing. And I feel like through the witnessing of his works, his faith was beginning to arise inside of her to the point where she says, listen, I want you to get this. It's not her saying what she said. It's his faith saying through her what she said. I don't even know if that made sense. It made sense here. Are you following me? And she says, if I just touch, 
If I just touch him, I will be healed. You see, it was through the witnessing of his works that produced the faith for the declaration to be made. If you waste all of your time filling, filling your mind with the works of the devil, don't be surprised that you'll start worshiping and, ce and celebrating the works of the devil without realizing it. Because you celebrate who's grabbed your attention. Whoever has captured your attention has become the person in whom you worship. Am I saying not to be aware of what's going on in the world? What I know, I'm not saying that, but I am saying don't allow those works to become the, 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 the influence that which you celebrate. Don't allow those works to take the place of the works of God inside of you. Listen, sometimes I just go on YouTube Miracle Crusades because I just need to see the hand of God working because everybody around me is saying this is happening or that is happening. But when I YouTube the videos and I get attention on the works of God, all of a sudden every other voice bows to the work of Jesus. Whose works are you beholding? Because the works that you're beholding is determining what's being produced in you. As a man thinks in himself, so he... <laughs> you see, today's thoughts are becoming the prophetic voice of tomorrow's future. There's a divine connection between what you're thinking today and what you're fulfilling tomorrow. Today's thoughts are shaping tomorrow's destiny. You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. You sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. What are you thinking? Whose works are you beholding? The work of Christ or the work of Satan? You see, this is one way that I've learned over the years how to partner with the faith of Christ is by constantly putting myself in a place of witnessing the works of Christ. I remember one of the first times I went to Brazil. I actually showed the video last night. I was there. This lady was born blind. Her head just had a white eyeball in, in her head. And we were praying with her. This group was praying with her. And we literally began to watch the pupil form in her eye. I don't know about you, but that, that did something in me. <laughs> I don't know about how you would respond to that moment, but I was like, oh, you know, it was just, it was crazy. And it, even after the video, man, she went berserk because she started seeing, after that video was played, she, the pupil completely formed and she began to see out of that eye in which she was born blind. Just 20 feet from her, that miracle happens 20 feet from her. There's another group of people praying for this guy paralyzed from the waist down in a wheelchair. We didn't get that one on video. I wish we could have because it was funny. He's in a wheelchair. They're praying with him. The power of God hits her, then hits this guy. He stands himself up out of the wheelchair. The power of God goes through his body. He begins to walk in the back of the church. And then all of a sudden, there's an exit door like, like it is here. He begins to walk out, out the exit door. And we stopped him and said, sir, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, listen, I haven't walked in 25 years. I'm going for a walk. <laughs> I, said, well, I said, well, I guess you've gotten what you came for, you know. You received your miracle. <laughs> but my thing is, Whose works are we beholding? Do you constantly set your heart to behold, to behold the beauty of Christ? Do you constantly set your heart to behold the works that he's doing? I used to do street ministry every day. But I would, during my hour break at work, I would always go to this one particular gas station and, and pray for people. I would stand at the gas pumps, wait for people to come get gas, and I would pray for them at the gas pump. Well, over the weeks, people started being healed, and the manager was watching this week after week <laughs> through her little office, you know. And finally, she comes out and says, uh, I notice you come stand by these gas pumps every day, and you're praying for people, and people are weeping and crying when they leave. What, what are you doing to them? I'm like, well, I'm a Christian. 
And I've been praying for healing with people, and God's been touching people and healing them. She said, really? Well, obviously something is happening with these people. Can you pray for me? I have a tumor on the side of my hip. That's what she says to me. I said, well, don't show it to me. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to pray for you right now. I laid my hands on her shoulder and began to pray. It didn't seem like anything happened in the moment. She goes home that night. Goes to sleep. When she wakes up in the morning, she steps out of the bed. When she steps out of the bed, the tumor falls off into the floor. I don't know about you, but that excites me. You see, and it was all produced because she was witnessing the work of Christ at her job. She was witnessing the work of Christ day after day with people encountering him. And so when I said to her, I've been praying for people in the name of Jesus and things are happening, she didn't have to muster up any faith to believe me because she had witnessed it. Yeah. I remember one time on my lunch break. Is this okay me sharing some stories right now? I remember one, another time on my lunch break, I was, I was on my way back to work. I, I was actually being a little bit late to work, which, you know, I should have been crucified for that, <laughs> right? No, I'm playing. And I happened to drive by this car wash, and there's this man sitting out at the car wash, sitting on this stool, and, and he has this cane sitting beside him. And I feel like the Lord says, stop and, and pray for him. I'm like, well, God, I'm, I'm late for work, so I, did, I just roll down my window and scream at him. And so I did, I'm riding by, and I just wrote down my window. I said, I'd be healed! Like that, you know, you know my, my intense face. You know, I'm, a, I'm a kind of an intense guy sometimes. And you, I can tell it kind of startled this guy, you know. I'm just, I'm just riding my, hey, be healed! And keep going. And the Lord says, no, I didn't, William, I didn't tell you to just scream at the poor guy. I told you to stop and pray for him. And so I turned my, I, at this time I had a pickup, and I turned the, the car around, and you, you know, there's a car wash, but I didn't notice this, this curb right in front of the car wash, and I thought it was a driveway. And so I turn around. I'm trying to hurry up, get out and pray for him and get back to work before I get in trouble. And so what? you know what happens? I pull into the car wash, but I hit this curb. Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Like that, right there. <laughs> and I stop, and this guy's like, oh, my God. He's coming to kill me. Like, you're going to see fear all over this guy, you know. And so I open the door, and I stand out because, once again, I'm in a hurry. I need to get to work. I, I, I get out, and I start running toward him. I said, be healed. Be healed right now. Work. I'm running to this poor guy. <laughs> Looking back at it now, it's like the best evangelistic tool here. And as soon as I say, be healed in Jesus' name, he stands up. I don't know if it's because he was afraid that I was going to kill him or what. But he stand, when he stands up, he realizes he's healed. And when he realizes he's healed, he throws his cane down and begins to dance in the car wash. He gets healed. I walk up to him. He says, man, who are you? I said, I'm an angel. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I, just, I told him, I said, I'm just a lover of Jesus, and I have seen God heal so many people, and I just wanted to stop and pray with you. Now, bye. I got to get to work. <laughs> but you see, those things that have been demonstrated in my life have been a byproduct of the works that I have been witnessing, because when I gave my life to him, I said, I'm going to witness your works. I'm going to put myself in a place where I'm seeing Jesus move. Some of us may be dead because we haven't gotten where Jesus is moving. I mean dead, I'm talking dead in our faith. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. It was through seeing what the Father was doing. <laughs> Do we spend our time seeing what Jesus is doing or seeing what the devil is doing? I haven't managed my time very well because I have at least 35 more points to go over. Yes, <laughs> 
I would like to share my story with you. Is that okay? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's actually the last point, too. I was just lying about the 35, <laughs> kind of. And the last point of cooperating with the faith of Christ is by having an encounter with Christ. When you meet the person of Jesus, you, 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 won't, you don't have to muster up belief. Because when you meet the person of Jesus, it produces in you faith. The reason I know this and the reason I'm standing up here before you right now in such a passionate life and such a passionate heart for Jesus is because I grew up in a home where both my parents were alcoholics, just like many of us in culture today do, right? But not only were they alcoholics, they were atheists. So I grew up believing there is no God. I grew up believing there's no way that he can be real because I don't see it in the life that I, that I see in my parents. By the time I was 15 years old, I was a full-blown alcoholic and drug addict. That was the only way that I knew how to escape the reality that I lived in. And do you realize I lived in Alabama, the Bible Belt? Do you realize I was around Christians every single day and not once did I hear the name Jesus ever spoken to me? Not once did someone ever stop and say, William, I see that you're, 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 you're addicted. I need to tell you about a way you can get out into freedom. I never once had somebody that had the courage, that had a nerve inside of them, that had met a resurrected king that would say, William, I will tell you about him. By the time I was 20 years old, I had hit rock bottom. I had been living inside of crack houses for the past two years. I had sold everything that I had to smoke crack. The only thing that I had left was the clothes that it was on my body. And my friend had invited me to stay in his apartment with him for a couple of weeks before he kicked me out and I had to go find somewhere else to go because at that point I had burned every bridge of my life. No one, no one was there for me because I had hurt and, 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 and backstabbed every person that I knew. May of 2005, I found myself in a situation where I overdosed on drugs. As I'm laying in the hospital room, the doctors are, are pumping drugs out of my stomach and pumping things out of me, and I'm hearing the doctor saying, man, I don't, I don't know if he's going to make it. Now, I didn't believe God was real. I wasn't there in that moment praying for God to come and help me. But... This, I hear the doctor saying, hey, I don't know if he's going to make it. And so when they finally get my stomach pumped out, the doctors come and do tests and stuff on me a couple days later. And they say, William, if we, your kidneys are completely shut down. And your other organs are beginning to fail because of the amount of meth and crack cocaine that's in your body. In other words, they just gave me my death sentence. They're like, listen, we cannot get, if your other, other organs don't, do not begin to work, and we cannot find kidney donors for you, you will die. So I'm giving a, a death warrant right there saying, and I don't know if I'm going to wake up the next day. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to live my life. But because I had never once met a Christian to ever present to me Jesus, I didn't believe Jesus was real, so I didn't begin to cry out to him either. But by God's grace and by God's love, one night I see a bright light shine into my room. <laughs> I see this light shine into my room. And in this light shines into my room, this man steps out of the light and he's clothed in a white gown with brown hair with a brown goatee. I mean, I know. And he begins to walk toward my bed. As he begins to walk toward me, this, this presence comes upon me. And my body just begins to tremble. At first, I had this emotion of fear, but then it was like love overcame fear. And, and as this man began to walk to the foot of my bed, he doesn't say anything to me. And now, let me say this, this. I'm not imagining this. This is a literal light coming into my room. A literal person walked into my hospital room. He turns away like he's going to walk out of the door, and he sits down in the floor. When he sits down in the floor, a river of water bursts from the wall and goes out the other side of the wall. 
At that time, I'm like, this has gotten really weird. (laughs) There's this literal man sitting in my hospital floor, a literal river of water flowing right there in front of him. And all of a sudden, he sticks his hands in this water. He begins to wash his hands like he's cleansing himself. And that's when I heard the voice of my creator. An audible voice spoke to me in that moment, and the voice of God said, The waters that you see will purify and cleanse you if you receive Jesus the Christ as Lord and Savior. As soon as I hear the voice of my Creator, my created being responds to His voice. And I say, Yes, I want you, Jesus. As soon as I said yes to Him, the power went into my body, and I began to tremble. The next morning I wake up, the doctors come in, they begin to do tests and things on me, and they come back with this freak out look on their face, and they say, we, we, we don't know what to tell you, but not only are your kidneys better, but it's as if you've never done drugs before. <laughs> now, now, Jesus! Yes, sir, come on! Yes! So, so don't, that's why I can stand up here with a passionate declaration of who he is. Because he met me when I didn't believe. He met me when I didn't care. He met me when I gave him every reason to say no. He met me right there. I go home. I get home and I realize I'm speaking in funny languages. (laughs) I'm just walking around in my house and all of a sudden, I wasn't doing that. But you know, I just start breaking out in tongues. And I'm like, oh my, this is weird. I need to find out what's going on with me. So so I decided I probably better read a Bible now that I'm a Christian. It wasn't until I met a Christian that I found out God no longer healed people. (laughs) Two weeks later, I get a letter in the mail from the hospital saying that my $50,000 hospital bill was paid in full. I have a quarter point, a quarter parents to go to because when I went to the hospital, they found drugs in my pocket, drug paraphernalia and things in my pocket. I had two felonies at the time, and when I was when I got before the judge, I was looking at my third felony. So I'm, I'm looking at some prison time. I get before the judge, and the judge says, "Mr. Wood," because they know me pretty well at that point. I said, Mr. Wood, this is a strange thing that's ever happened with you. You have to be one of the luckiest people that I know. He said, we have seemed to have misplaced the the drugs that we found on you. (laughs) And I said, I said, what drugs? (laughs) I'm not going to tell him I had it. Everybody just told me I didn't. But then he goes on to say this. He says, well, I'm going to have to charge you a fine for this court appearance. And I want you to pay a fine of $666. My natural father is standing in my courtroom. My natural father stands up. And he says, I'll pay his debt in full. Do you realize that Jesus thinks you're to die for Do you realize that with every reason that you gave him not to choose you, he still still rolls up and say, I'll pay your debt in full because you are worth dying for. Do, 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 Do you realize that? Do you realize that Jesus wasn't going to the cross, he was going through the cross? Because he saw you on the other end of the cross when it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because love, when love sees something, it doesn't consider any sacrifice that needs to be made. Because love only sees a separation from the one that needs to encounter love. Following Jesus only looks like sacrifice to those who are not in love. 
I'm here to tell you that I heard the gospel from an angel, but I should have heard it from you. I should have heard it from burning ones. I should have heard it from someone that says, I'll yield to him. I'll, I'll follow him and I'll become the demonstration of him on earth. I didn't meet someone like that. Will you be that person for someone? You see, when I met the resurrected Christ, I didn't have to worry about believing because when I met the resurrected Christ, faith was a byproduct of the encounter. And when you meet him, you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to worry about the lies of Satan. You don't have to worry about all the conditions of that. All you can do is say, I've met him and he has become my life because as he died for me so that I can live, I am now going to die for him so that he can live through me. I, somebody needs to be excited in this place. Yes. Jesus! If you would, just stand with me, because we do need to take lunch break. <laughs> I want to give you just about 30 seconds to close your eyes and put your hands out in front of you. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds here just to cry out to the Lord. You can speak out loud. You can speak unto yourself. Just begin to just worship Jesus. Just begin to be adore the King. <laughs> just keep pressing into him. Just keep pressing into him. He, he's worthy of you pressing into him. He, he, he's, he's worthy of you saying, I, I want you, Jesus. He's worthy of you saying, right now in this moment, I'm laying it all down and I'm coming after you with every part of my being because he came after you with every part of his. Whoa. I just see the Holy Spirit beginning to touch some of you right now. Holy Spirit, I bless what you're doing. This lady off to my left wearing this black sweater right now. I just bless what the Holy Spirit is doing with you right now. Increase. Increase. There it is. There it is. More, 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 more. Get a Lord. Oh, more, more. I bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. There it is. He's going in deeper now. There it is. There it is. Increase. 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 There it is. This lady white right here in front of me in the white. The Holy Spirit is all over you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you to zap her right now. Just come upon her right now. Lord. More, more. Get her, Lord. Oh. Just press into him. He, he's worthy of it. He, he, he's worthy of you pressing into him. He's worthy of your attention. He's worthy of it right now. More. Well, press into him right now. Holy Spirit, come in a greater way. I bless what you're doing in this room, Holy Spirit. Increase it. Increase it right now. There's someone in here right now. There's someone in here right now. You're, you're at that crossroads and you need to make a choice of if you're going to serve Jesus or not. And God is tugging on your heart. You say, I want to give my life to Jesus right now. Just raise your hand to me. Raise your hand. That's you? That's you, sir? Just raise your hand. That's two. 
Who else is it? Who else is it? I'm going to ask you to come up right here. This is, a, this is a step of faith. This is not a time to stay where you are. If you just said, I want Jesus, just come right here. Just come right here. That, that act of obedience. Come on. Step. Come on. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to do so. 19. 18. 17. It's scared right there. 16. 15. This is the best decision that you're making right now. This is the key. <laughs> Jesus. 14. 13. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. Two. Do you guys realize what you're doing right now? Is you're making the best decision of your life because Jesus has made himself real to you right now. You may have already made this choice at one point, but I, I'm making this right here as an act of your declaration saying from this point on, I am giving it all to him. When people give their life to Jesus, the, the congregation should begin to celebrate what Christ is doing. The congregation should begin to celebrate it. Jesus! Give them praise. So Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit right now, let me talk to you guys just for a moment. You're making the best choice right now to say I'm going for Jesus. The word of God says whoever believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth shall be saved. And I'm asking you, do you believe that Christ is the King, that He is your Savior, He is your Lord? Do you believe that? And when you confess that right now out loud, to say, Christ, I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. It's okay, you can say it a little louder. You just made the best choice. And so I encourage you as, as next steps right now to find a church. If you're not in a church, if, if this church or whatever, find somewhere to get plugged in because life change happens in the context of relationship. <laughs> so just hold, close your eyes and hold your hands. I'm going to begin to pray for you. Can I, students, can you come up here and help me catch some people just in case? Holy Spirit, right now. I bless what you're doing. I ask that you fill them right now with your presence. With a fresh baptism of your spirit to come right now. There it is. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just begin to activate inside of them new things and new gifts right now. So Holy Spirit, I bless what you're doing. I bless what you're doing right now, Holy Spirit. Increase. Increase. There it is. More. Increase, increase right now more. Increase right now, Father. Fill them up right now, Lord. Fill them up right now, Lord. I just bless what you're doing. Increase. There it is. There it is. There it is right now. Increase. Increase. Can you and the congregation begin to pray for these up here? Just begin to celebrate them. Just begin to cry out for them right now. Just begin to celebrate right now. I bless what you're doing, Lord. Increase. Increase. There it is. There it is. I see the Holy Spirit going deeper right now. He's going deeper right now. Holy Spirit, more. Increase. Increase. I bless what you're doing right now, God. There it is. Begin to cry out for them. Begin to pray for them. Begin to celebrate these people. They're precious. 
More. Just receive, my son. Just receive, my son. Just receive. Just receive. Right there. There you go. There you go. Holy Spirit, more. I bless what you're doing. I see those tears right now, God. I ask that you bless those tears right now. More love. Sunday. More love. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we all celebrate together? Jesus! 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 Thank you for giving me, giving me your time today. I always love to see when God touches people. And I always hope that my story and my message and my life is a, an encouragement for people to say all, all that you have to do is say yes to him. That's all I ever did. <laughs> but just agree with what he's accomplished. So my encouragement as we go throughout lunch and throughout the day, my encouragement to you is this. Don't pass the brokenhearted in the streets and not do something. I'm not saying you have to go to every single person, but I am saying you can go to the ones God is leading you to go to. So as we get off of our fast right now <laughs> and break for lunch, I just want to say, go as sent ones, empowered by Christ. Bless you guys. Wow. We are so thankful for that deposit. Let's give thanks to the Lord for for the word, for, for what Williams deposited in us. Bef before we break for lunch, just a